so important in your life about Brooklyn, New York? Well, Brooklyn, New York is important because that's my place of origin. That's where I was born. That's where I made my first sound. You know. <laughs> and that's the place where I had short pants and my mother would take me to the black church every Sunday with the bow tie, you know, and the, the sisters would block you in. You know, because you couldn't go to the toilet but so many times. <laughs> so uh, every Sunday was the black church. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where we had big band rehearsals, 11 o'clock in the morning. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where we would play and hang out in Calypso dances. So in essence, I grew up in the African-American community in Brooklyn called bed mm -hmm. And in that area, we had our own black theaters. We would choose that we can go eight, nine years old and see a short on Bessie Smith or on Duke Ellington or Carol Basie. So culturally speaking, it was a high point of my life growing up in Brooklyn. In addition, having such great musicians as Max Roach, Hubie Blake, Hermie Chittison, Cecil Payne, Ray Abrams, Duke Jordan. So many giant musicians come out of Brooklyn. So that was my foundation. Well, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they think about uh, the boroughs of New York, they think about Manhattan as being the center of the jazz world. But point of fact, when you were coming up, there actually may have been more jazz clubs in Brooklyn than there were in Manhattan. What, what was the scene like in Brooklyn as far as the music as you were coming up? Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize, I, I think Brooklyn is something like the fourth of fifth biggest city in the United States. Brooklyn is enormous, you know? So you have different jazz clubs in different parts of Brooklyn. You go out around Coney Island, another place Bay Ridge, another place Red Hook. So Brooklyn was spread out. But our center of gravity was the bedford stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. which was Fulton Street, based upon there. And we had many different clubs. And also have to point out that uh, it was a time of dance. So there was no separation between the music and dance. So whether you played solo piano or trio or big band, you had to play people for dance, you see. And so the music and dance were combined. So we, we grew up in that kind of, kind of atmosphere. Well, t tell these folks about the influence of your mother and father. OK. My dad uh, was born in Panama of uh, Jamaican heritage. My mother was born in Virginia. And uh, they met in Brooklyn and produced me. And they were very proud people. And I have to point out the neighborhood was what we call multicultural, you know. And we had the Italians, the Germans, the, the, the Spanish, you know. So you go here and have uh, Spanish food, you go have pizza here and whatnot. But culturally speaking, the Germans, the neighborhood was there, you know. Mm -hmm. So in, in our area, our mother and fathers were extremely important to us because it was a time of serious hypocrisy when it came to the image of African people. Uh, our color was no good. Our hair was inferior. Uh, we had no civilization. Europe came and civilized Africa. So that was in the cinema, and that was in the educational system. As a child, I would read books, and they would show an image of myself that I would be ashamed of. Remember, the whole stereotype of African people was very serious. But the, the, the black movie theaters counteracted that, because we can go there and see images of the Ellington Orchestra, and Louis Jordan, his blues, everybody, you know, dressed beautifully to show the spirit, the spirit of our people. Now your dad. So mom and pop got <coughs> a background because of them. Mm -hmm. So my dad, he 
loved Africa with a passion. Uh, to the point that growing up in Brooklyn in our apartment, he had many books written by African-American, African scholars, and European scholars who wrote the truth about the great African empires. In other words, what preceded Africa before colonialism, before slavery. What was like the ancient empires of Egypt and Songhai and Ghana and, and uh, uh, Mali and, and going on. So dad had the books in the house. Also, he would have maps on the wall of African kings and queens. So he would teach me at a very early age that Africa had more queens than any other civilization in the history of the world. They explained to me that how much I knew about our history as a people. Because our history began with slavery, or it began with colonialism, you see. So that was pop. In addition to that, when I was six years old, he was a very fiery man, you know. He, he loved Marcus God, and he was fire. When I was six years old, he said, he said, my son, I want to tell you one thing. He said, never let anybody change what I'm saying to you. He said, you are an African born in America. Therefore, you have to have that historical, cultural, geographical point of reference. Mm -hmm. He said, all people on the planet have a place of reference. You know. If you're a European heritage, you're an Asian heritage, you have a place where you know you can go back two or three thousand years ago, for example. But that history was taken away from us. You know. So Pop, he pointed to me that I have to study the great African civilizations. He gave me that. Mom gave me the black church. You know. In addition to that, our parents in the neighborhood, I knew Max Roach's mother, I knew his father, they knew my mother, they knew my father. In other words, our parents were the ones who took us to hear Ellington and all the people. Our parents were the ones who were into the music. And they would bring all kinds of music. Could be opera, could be eclipses, could be blues, because they were multicultural. They were really deep into culture, you see. Mm -hmm. So between the two of them, they programmed me in a way, you see, because they had great pride, they had great dignity, but they had great spirituality. Now your dad was a descendant of the Maroons, so he he had a he had a consciousness in his blood, right? Say it again. I said your dad was a descendant of the Maroons. Yes. So I he had that later. he had that consciousness in his blood. Yeah. I, I, I didn't find that too much later. He was descendant of the Maroons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was like he was saying to me. He said, he said, you know, one thing I have to point out. Uh, what we call the blues, what we call the blues structure, which today, sometimes in, in, the, in the modern world today, uh, we get away from the blues. So, oh man, that's, that's something else. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. But the whole concept of the blues is like, it's like message. And the early blues singers and the early people who could not speak the languages, they couldn't speak English, they couldn't speak French, they couldn't speak Spanish, they couldn't speak... Portuguese. So for each colonial power, they took certain words to get a message across. And to get the message across would be a combination of a very few words, or with sound, or with a look. And our parents weren't like that, you see, because my father, he would uh, give me a look, and I knew when I messed up. <laughs> so, and they would tell you very simple things. Be with the best minds you can find. That's been my life. I've been blessed to meet some of the most incredible people on the planet. He made me take piano lessons. I didn't want to take piano lessons because I was very tall. I wanted to play ball, and I was a terrible ball player anyhow. But he made me take piano lessons, thank goodness, you know. And he gave me Africa. So that combination was my foundation. But not just only my family, women, but the neighborhood was. So, so it was a combination of, of uh, how it was growing up in your home, but also in your neighborhood as well, these influences. Now, now uh, musically, you mentioned that your father insisted that you take piano lessons. How old were you when you started? Well, you know, I started very late, actually. I started around 14. 
Mm -hmm. I started very late. Did so I, how so how'd that go? It didn't go well because <laughs> <laughs> you know you you know when you grow up in in, in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, you could be walking down the street. Here's a restaurant, and in the restaurant they got a jukebox, and you had Duke Ellington Mainstream up loud, all out in the street, you know, because everything was live. If Joe Lewis won a fight, the whole black community would come out in the street. There was no TV. Everything was direct, person to person, soul to soul, you know, and that made it so different, you see. So I got away from your question. I got too descriptive. <laughs> no, you, 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 your piano lessons. My piano lessons. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, I had this. Uh, my dad got this wonderful teacher, and in fact, there's a picture of her in the book. Her name was Mrs. Chapman, and this woman would come to my house, and she got 50 cents a lesson, and she was very dignified. Those ladies of that period. I cannot emphasize the way they dress. My mothers and fathers, grandmothers, they, they were absolute class, you know. And she would come, and every time I hit a, a bad note, she hit my hand with the ruler. So now I couldn't say anything because my father, he was always watching. And if I wasn't correct, you know, I'm in trouble, you know, because Pop didn't play. He was serious, right? So finally, after three years with this lady, she went to my father and said, Mr. Wesson, she said, save your money. I said, your son will never play the piano. <laughs> and this is a true story. And I always tell the woman, I said, if, if I get to the happy hunting ground, I'm going to look for that sister. <laughs> and what she had to go through to try to get me to play the piano. But Pop didn't give up. He got another teacher called Professor Adwell, and he knew a few popular songs. So by dealing with the European concept of scale, the technique of the piano and whatnot, I was able to also play a little blue and a few popular songs. And that was the foundation of music, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we were earlier when we were doing the, uh, the, the television interview, I, I talked about the fact that your development was quite different than a lot of uh, so-called jazz musicians. Uh, in, 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 in the sense that, you know, you, you didn't follow a real kind of linear path where you, you, you went to, you had piano lessons, you went to music school, you were a side man, and then you became a band leader and that kind of thing. Because point of fact, you didn't determine that you were going to be a professional musician until what at least today would be considered the advanced age of 29 years old. So, I mean, how did you make that leap? You took the piano lessons as a teenager, but it took you to the <coughs> age of 29, relatively advanced, before you determined that you were going to be a professional musician. Why did it take so long? Well, I guess because I loved the music before I ever played the music. Mm -hmm. And we grew up, I, before I ever practiced piano, all the kids, and whether you're playing basketball or football or shooting pool or whatnot, who's better, Coleman Hawkins or Lester Young? So for, we lived the music. The music was our survival mm -hmm. because we, we weren't treated properly outside of the community, you see. It wasn't a mixture like it is today, you see. So the music was our survival. We would never survive without the music. Mm -hmm. So being such a big fan of the music, I heard Mr. Nat King Cole. I heard Mr. Art Tatum. I heard Mr. Errol Gardner. I heard Mr. Carol Basie. I heard Mr. James P. Johnson. I heard Mr. Thelonious Monk. I heard Mr. Bud Powell. I heard Mr. Herman Chittison. You see, I go on all and on. So with that kind of royalty on the piano, I never thought I was going to be a pianist. Because that was, for me, the period of royalty of the piano. We'll never have a period like that. Were you intimidated? Yeah, completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> completely. Mm -hmm. Completely. And, and, and it's a form of respect. Mm -hmm. It's a form of respect because you have to recognize that in the history of the planet, there are certain people that arrive at a certain time and give us beauty. Whether and wherever it is in the planet, there are certain people like to create a sense, okay, to Gellington, bang, you come here at this particular time. 
and you lift your people by doing black tavern fantasy or black brown <laughs> or take the crazy whatnot. Because every one of these songs is a story of the people. It's not just music. Mm -hmm. It's a story of the life of African American people and how we survive. You see? So with that kind of lineup, yes, I was intimidated. Yeah. And it wasn't until Max Roach, God bless him, Max Roach's house, he was like our cultural center in Brooklyn. Because Max Roach, the whole, Charlie Parker's rhythm section at that time was all from Brooklyn. Duke Jordan on piano, Tommy Potter on bass, and Max Roach on drums. So Max's house became like, like a kind of a cultural center. George Russell was living in Matt with Max, and George Russell was working on the great, the great massive work of Dizzy Gillespie, Cabana B, Cabana Bop, when he bought the African-Cuban drummer, Chano Pozo, from Cuba to New York, to have that African-Cuban drum with that incredible orchestra, see? So Max, Max was the key. He was the key for everything. So one day, Charlie Parker was in the house, and I would go to his house and just sit in the corner and watch. Here's George Russell, here's Max, here's Charlie Parker, here's Dizzy. I'm just sitting there watching. Because, uh, you know, I wasn't a professional musician. But Max had heard me play something. Mm -hmm. So he said to me, he said, Rand, he said, uh, play some of your songs for Charlie Parker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, because I have so much respect and so much of a genius this man was, Charlie Parker. Serious. Completely took music and took it somewhere that never happened before. You can imagine it. But he was a very spiritual person. He was, for me, kind of angelic in a way. You look at his he was special. So Max told me to play songs. So I songs for Charlie Parker. So I got to the piano and I played something. I was nervous, man. Mm -hmm. So then Charlie said, yeah, that was nice like that. So to end the story, one month later, Myself and a drummer named Maurice Brown, who studied with Max Rose. She was a student, because Max had a studio also in Brooklyn, and he would teach the young drummers. So this young man and myself, we went to go here in Broadway at a place called the Royal Roof, <coughs> which was Tad Dameron's band with Charlie Rouse, Fats Novaro. I forgot the rest of the musicians. So you go down the stairs like this. You and we were going down, and Charlie Parker's at the bar. And he calls, he does like this. <coughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know he was calling me. Mm -hmm. He was calling me. So I went down there, and he said, he said, what you doing, Red? I said, uh, we're coming to hear Tad Dameron. He said, come with me. He took us upstairs, put us in a taxi cab, took us to 52nd Street to either the three, don those three deuces or the Honest Club, I forgot the name, because all the clubs on 52nd Street were like this, with all the giants, you know. He walked into the club, and there was a small combo playing. Now, one thing that you never do, unless you want to die, is interrupt a musician when he's playing the piano, or the drums, or the saxophone. But Charlie Parker was so powerful, he walked up on the stage, he told the piano player to get up in the middle of the song. <laughs> Tell him. <laughs> he told the drummer to get up. I said, wow, you know. He told me to sit at the piano. He told the drummer to sit at the drums, took out his horn, played with us for 45 minutes, packed up his horn and left. Never said a word. <laughs> So for one year, we were in heaven. We played with Charlie Parker. <laughs> so by, the, by, by this point, you still hadn't determined that you were going to be a professional musician. No, well, it turned out that the drugs hit the black community very bad. And uh, the creator had another plan for me. Heroin hit the community. You know, so many things are done to, to stop African-American people when they're making progress. You know, this is right after the war. Right after the war. Yeah. I was in the war three years. I was uh, one year in Okinawa, two years in the army, came back home and whatnot. And that's when the music came out. Monk and Dizzy and Charlie Parker and Bud. I said, wow, music I never heard before. In fact, I didn't even understand this music. Mm 
Mm -hmm. What kind of music is this, you know? It was that wonderful period, you know? At the same time, the things were really, really bad. Then musicians weren't getting much work, so what do you do? You give them alcohol, you give them drugs, you know? Because the community always look up to the artists, always, you know? And so this is what happened. So I end up in the Berkshires, thanks to a good friend of mine up in Lenox, Mass. I worked up there for a while, combination dishwasher. I cut down trees. I was a chambermaid for a minute. <laughs> but the whole purpose of it was, this is the area where the Boston Symphony Orchestra performs seven weeks a year. And uh, I had an opportunity to be in an area that everybody was into music. You know, all kinds of music. And I needed that, you know, because Brooklyn had just, things had gotten bad, you know. Mm -hmm. So while I was there, while I was working, I would play piano at night, and the people up there heard me. And the European classical audiences up there, and artists, they encouraged me, you know. They said they'd love to hear you play. So I eventually <coughs> ended, ended up being a pianist up there, and I brought my trio up there. And up there, why it was so important, this place was called the Music Inn. And this place, I would tell you about like around 1950, 1951. For 10 years, due to Professor Marshall Stearns, who wrote the book, The Story of Jazz, English professor, maybe one of jazz's first scholars of music, he had this global concept of African culture, which my father had already given me spiritually. My mother had already given me spiritually. But when I met Marshall, Marshall had a concept of seeing things visually and with your ears. So because of Marshall's stories at the music in, with a matter of a few years, I met Mahalia Jackson during a three o'clock in the afternoon class on African spirituality in the black church. I met Professor Dr. Willis James of Spelman College in Alabama, who was a specialist of field cry hollers, how the African people when they couldn't speak the colonial languages, how they communicated through sounds during the plantation times. I experienced him. I met Billy Taylor up there. I met uh, Candido from Cuba. I met Babatuni Olatunji from Nigeria. I heard the two of them discussing Yoruba culture, how it was in Nigeria and how it changed in Cuba. I was up there when I met Al Mims and Leon James, who were two of the great dancers of the Savoy Ballroom. And how that period, which I mentioned before dance, that when, if it was an Ellington or a Chick Webb, any of the big bands would come to the Savoy Ballroom, they would come with some new music. They would always have the best dancers to create a new dance to go with the new music. There was no separation between the music and the dance, because the African people like to dance. And the music's always been like this. And what a lot of people don't realize that in the Second World War, they put a 20% tax on places of dance. So many of the dance halls closed down. And that's how our music got separated from dance. And that's how the image came out that jazz musicians can't play for dance, you see. But nothing further from the truth, you see. So that was, was a combination of all those things. All right, now, you determined during your time in the Berkshires that yes, this was a profession that you wanted to pursue. That's also where you made your first record. How did that come about? Well, uh, there was a, a recording company called Riverside Records, owned by Bill Grower and R. Keep News, and they had a, a magazine they called The Record Changer. It was very interesting because they were considered what they called old figs. In other words, after Roy Elwood, nothing happened in jazz, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was that period when the music changed. They said, no, it's got to be closer to the, to the blues tradition, mm -hmm. you know. So they put out this wonderful magazine. But in this magazine, and they were putting out records of, uh, of uh, prison songs, songs that African people in America were singing during the time of prison, how they would develop certain music with chains on their legs, and certain rhythms and sounds. Uh, they had music on Congolese, traditional music. They had music of Ethiopia, music of, of, uh, of West Africa. And they heard me play the piano, and they decided they wanted to do their own record company. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, they put out piano rolls. 
So with the piano rolls, they have James P. Johnson or Fats Waller, uh, Jimmy Yancey, Count Basie, so on. they would also make piano rolls. And the other thing, which is how they made their money, which really blew my mind, they made their money off of the sound of sport cars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a collection of people. Sound effects. The sound yes, yeah. of certain sport cars. That's how they made their money. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, they asked me would I, would I make a, their first recording. By this time, I was playing a lot of solo piano, but I didn't have the confidence to be a solo pianist, and uh, they wanted me to do a recording, and uh, they wanted me to play solo piano. I wanted to use a trio, and we compromised with piano and bass. Uh, the bassist was Mr. T Dr. Sam Gill now. Uh, he's been 48 years with the Denver Symphony Orchestra, but he's out from Brooklyn, and he started. we started together. And finally, they wanted me to do music of a popular American composer. And I always liked the music of, of Cole Porter. It was very, very uh, uh, energetic at that time, his music, you know. So my first recording was a piano and bass, and I did the music of Cole Porter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now from there, you went on to make one more recording for Riverside, right? No, more than one. I made uh, four. Four, right. I did Bohemia. I did uh, Get Happy. Right. And the one with Art Blakey, the second recording. The second record was with Art Blakey for a tri was the trio record. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, one of your great collaborations, and it's apropos that we've just concluded International Women's History Month, and we did a thing on the radio about a great woman that a lot of people don't know about, but a lot of people should. Uh, she is an NEA jazz master, and she was your was your collaborator. I'm speaking of the great Melba Liston, who was your arranger for so many years, and with whom you shared a relationship similar to what Duke Ellington shared with Billy Strayhorn. How did you and Melba Liston come together, and and what was the relationship like in terms of? you as a composer and she as a arranger, how did she help you realize your music? I think, you know, when I think about it, th th there was so much music. There were so many incredible artists at that time, you know, and, and everybody was unique. But maybe I was more fascinated with Dizzy. Mm -hmm. Because Dizzy, when he brought the African Cuban drum into to his music, this is writing music about some of the ancient African empires. Mm -hmm. In fact, he, he did a he did a song called Kush. You know, at the time we thought that was a bebop word mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. But Dizzy was night in Tunisia. He was already painting through his music, Africa. You know, and he had this incredible orchestra. So when he come to New York, we go to hear Dizzy. So that band, he had Lee Morgan. He had Al Gray, he had Charlie Pursip, you know, and he had Melba Listen. I didn't mention all the musicians. So at that time, I was playing trio, uh, sometimes at Birdland, sometimes at uh, the Five Spot. I started playing trio in New York, and I went to hear Dizzy's big band, because I wanted to hear what, what they were doing, because, I mean, Gillespie, I mean, I could talk about him all night. He's not recognize the genius that he was because he was so funny. You know, he made you laugh. He had that essential element in our music, uh, which is humor. And people may not recognize that, but the part of the healing process of music is humor. So a could go to the piano and hit one sound and make you laugh. That comes out of Africa, you see. So... <laughs> So Melba. <laughs> Melba Liston. The big band was at the Birdland, and Melba played a solo on My Reverie. And she wrote the arrangements, and it was so beautiful. And I never saw a woman play a trombone before. So when she came off the stage, I introduced myself, you know. I said, Melba, I said, I'm Randy Weston, and we talked. It was kind of an electricity between the two of us. And she finally moved to New York, and she moved in Harlem 
not far from Mary Lou Williams. And I met Melba again, and that was the time when I had just signed with United Artists Records. And I had an opportunity to do my first recording. And I wanted to do seven waltzes for children. One for a little boy, one for a little girl, one for children climbing the hill, one for children ice skating, one for children singing the blues, and one for the children when the children arrive, what I call Earthbird. Mm -hmm. So I went to Melba, her little apartment, and I said to her what my idea was. I'd like her to do the arrangements. So she had a little piano, and I sat to the piano, and I would play, for example, Earth Birth. I played on the piano. She'd have her little tape recorder. Mm -hmm. Then we'd talk about the piece. And I'd say, for me, Earth Birth is when a child is born. Because when the child arrives, the first thing is music, you see. The first thing is rhythm. The first thing is sound, you know. You know. <laughs> the second piece about children singing the blues. The other piece was called Little Susan, which is the story of a little Calypso girl, mm -hmm. which ironically, she was five years old at that time, who was ironically ended up being the wife of our two old fellow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, the other piece was Let's Climb a Hill, Children Climbing a Hill, Up and Down. The other piece was... Um, uh, one more, one more. Of nice course, nice Penn's ice. Waltz. And nice ice. <clears throat> nice ice. Right. Uh, children ice skating. Mm -hmm. Pan's Waltz for my daughter Pamela. Little Mouse for my son. So in each piece, I played a little bit, then Melba took it. And we put together a group of Johnny Griffin, Melba Liston on trombone, Ray Copeland on trumpet, E.G. Suleiman on one piece, Bay Blues, Charlie Persip on drums, and Jamil Nasser on bass. Mm -hmm. And that was our first collaboration. The record was given five stars in mm -hmm. Downbeat. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment that Melba and I started until she died. And we covered many years together. And I can't emphasize the importance of Melba Listen because number one, she was an African-American woman. She was very quiet and very shy. And sometimes, in what they call show business, sometimes you have to make noise to be heard. I've heard some geniuses in music nobody's ever heard about because they were very quiet, very quiet. Melba was like that, but Melba wrote for the Supremes. She wrote for Gloria Lynn. She wrote for Count Basie, Duke Ellington. She, I took her to Jamaica. She spent five years in Jamaica working with reggae and Bob Marley. She was a total person. And she also could write for symphony orchestra, you see. So she was a very, very important part of my life. And we did many more recordings together. We, we did The Spirit of Our Ancestors, a piece I wrote for Dizzy Gillespie called African Sunrise and Machido. Uh, we did a concert with the Boston Pop Symphony Orchestra. <coughs> I wrote the music called Three African Queens, had a quintet of big black on percussion, Jamie and Nasser on bass, Frank Gann on drums, myself on the piano, Idris Sulem on the trumpet, with John Williams conducting 133 piece symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. Melbourne did all the arrangements. She had a way of whoever she wrote for, including Dinah Washington. She had a way of whatever you do, she would take what you do and expand on it, but make it sound like you. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some passages that she's done. For example, High Fly. You know, there's some passages that when you hear the arrangement, there's some parts you think is me, but it's not me. It's her. Mm -hmm. But she has, she was that genius and a great trombone player because I've heard very few trombone players get a big sound like Melville Listen. She had a huge sound. Now. One of the high points of your collaboration with Melba Liston was Uhuru Africa, uh, which is the suite that you wrote. Talk about that whole collaboration. Well, going back to mom and dad, going back to African people, uh, I developed a real love, I mean, a real love for African people, a real love, you know. And I saw this division. I saw it happening even with some of the people I grew up with, you know. Uh, He's from Mississippi, or he's from Georgia, or he's from 
Jamaica, he's from, you know, this kind of division. And I was always, always taught to look at the similarities. And the similarities are enormous of African people. So I wanted to do a work of music that would show that we, we are a global people, that our roots are the same. We have the same root. African music is as old as Africa itself. The whole concept of music came out of Africa, and it was used as a spiritual force. Music is the divine art. You can't see music, you can't touch music. Music is the highest form of Mother Nature. Only music can bring us, bring us together. Whether we're to the right or to the left or whatever, our philosophy or our color or our gender. And I see that, and I'm always amazed with music, no matter all these years, I play music. I look in the audience, I see the colors of the rainbow. And when music is right, we become one humanity. We cut all the barriers that separate us as a people. So Uhuru Africa was intended to show the beauty of African people, the, what we have contributed to world civilization, because we, we're getting this negative image of Africa mm -hmm. all of my life including up until today, you see? And Africa, Africa is the continent of art. Africa is the spiritual center of the planet Earth. All humanity began in Africa. Everybody on the planet Earth has African blood. I just discovered this sister. Her name is Ardi Apithecus. She, they found her in Ethiopia, and she's four and a half million years old. And they found out that she's one year older than Lucy, because we'd all have been maybe than Lucy, and Lucy's our oldest female ancestors. They found her, but by finding her, which took many years, between the University of Chicago, between the Egyptologists, the anthropologists, of, of Ethiopia and Africa and Europe coming together, doing research and picking out little bones, little specks to put this image of what Ardi must have looked like. And they constructed her through genius, you know, and they discovered not only was she four and a half million years old, but that she walked upright. Now the theory has always been that we are descendants from the chimpanzee, right? because we have similarities, you know. Mm -hmm. But she disproves all that. And she's walked upright and they constructed her. And they talked about her. And they say that she will change everything. Mm -hmm. So it just means that Africa, I think everybody should know something about the history of Africa because it's the beginning of all of us. Mm -hmm. And it gives us a better understanding of our planet. And gives us a better understanding of this music that we call jazz and blues and bossa nova and samba and reggae, all these names. Because if you take out the African rhythms of these music, you take out the African spirituality of this music, you don't have anything. You want to learn jazz, you have to go to the African American school. You want to go to music in Nigeria, you got to go to the African Nigerian school. You want to learn music in Cuba, you got to go to the African group. Because it's Mother Africa, which is the beginning of all of us, her spirituality has continued through the music. Well, tell us about the Uhuru Africa Project, how so, they came together. Uhuru, we got together. Talk about Uhuru? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I told you about Langston Hughes? No. Okay. You Langston told me Hughes. You, you haven't told them that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been on a program today, so if I sound repetitious, forgive me. Well, we got together with Melba, and we picked an incredible orchestra. The trumpet section was Freddie Hubbard, Clark Terry, Richard Williams, and Benny Bailey. The trombone section was Jimmy Cleveland, Quentin Jackson, and Slide Hampton. He had Julius Watkins on French horn. The reed section was Cecil Payne, Yusef Latif, G.G. Grice, Jerome Richardson, we had, uh, we had, uh, who else my, who did I leave on? Sahib Shahab, also in the reed section. 
And also we had Les Band on flute and guitar. We had Kenny Burrell on guitar. The rhythm section was Max Roche playing marimba. We had Baba Tunyo Latundi from Nigeria on African drum. We had Candido Camero from Cuba on congas. We had Amanda Peraza on bongos. And we had Ron Carter on bass, George de Vivier on bass. That was the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. We had uh, two incredible singers, Martha Flowers. Martha Flowers, incredible soprano from the European classical uh, position, but a wonderful singer. We had Brock Peters, who was a folk singer. We went to Langston Hughes. I said, Langston, please write a freedom poem for me. Because the part of the suite, the beginning is the freedom. It's called Freedom First. The second movement is called African Lady. The third movement is called Bantu. The fourth movement is called Cuchesa Blues. So I went to Langston. He said he'd be very happy to do that. Then I wanted to use an African language because as a boy growing up and going to the movies, the cinema as a child, I was always embarrassed by Tarzan and movies. I was always embarrassed of images of African people that we didn't have a language. But the truth is the whole concept of language began in Africa. The first language is the hieroglyphics that we know of, you see. So I want to use an African language. I went to the United Nations and I talked to several delegates. How could I choose one language to describe freedom Africa in a continent that has 900 languages, dialects, so many. So the general consensus was we would use Kiswahili. I met a man from Tanzania, his name was Tutimeke Sanga, professor of Kiswahili. And I went to him, I said, look, Langston Hughes is writing this freedom poem. Would you translate this poem into Kiswahili? Because I want to use it in English and also in Kiswahili on the recording. So people can hear not only the beauty of Langston's poetry in English, but they hear the beauty of an African language. So he said yes. So we got together. And Langston wrote the Freedom Poem. And Langston wrote some incredible words for a song I called African Lady. African Lady is dedicated to the African woman. Our mothers, our wives, our aunts, our dozens, our cousins, those women who are always in the background with the brothers always out front, always back there, giving us that spiritual support that we need. And Langston wrote beautiful words for that. And then we, Melba, started writing these arrangements. The day of the recording, two, two or three nights, no sleep, copying parts all over my apartment, you know. And finally, the day of the recording, the poor copyist, he was copying so many parts his ankles were completely swollen. And we physically had to carry him down two flights of stairs, put him in a taxi, get him to the studio, still copying parts. Because Melba was a genius. She would write arrangements, then maybe the last minute she would change the arrangement. She said, I want to do this, you know. But anyhow, this was 1960, in November. The same year as 17 African countries got their independence was 1960. And it was a period of celebration because it was very important for us, for Africa to be free. Because Africa is our ancestral home. As long as Africa is not free, we can never be free, no matter what we call ourselves, no matter where we go. And I believe that with passion. And so we got in the studio and the musicians themselves had no idea what this was going to be like. <laughs> all of a sudden we say, freedom, who of Africa, you know what I mean? In 1960, some people were a little afraid of Africa, you know. <coughs> yeah, they were afraid of that. Uh, I'm not African-American, I'm not. I have to do with Africa. I'm a Negro. You know, <laughs> afraid. I said, how could you be anything else if your grandfather, your great-grandfather, father were born here as Africans, now what else could you be? How could you disrespect them? Because it's because of their suffering, their, their pain, 
what they had to go through. So we are here today. We have to respect them, and they arrived here as Africans. So what else could we be, you see? So we did the recording. At the time, there was a lot of, a lot of conflict, you know. Uh, you know, why are you talk about Africa so much? But anyhow, to, to talk about this, I was so happy last year in November, we did, the, we did Uhuru Africa with a big band. The only members who were still left of the, of the original orchestra was Ron Carter. Ron couldn't make the date, but Candido did. In fact, Candido, Candido was going to be 90. Uh, we just did a celebration for him three nights ago at the Manhattan School of Music. It was incredible. And, and Charlie Pusit. But we celebrated that. And this time, we talked about the 17 African countries getting their independence the same time we did Uhuru Africa. Now, for me, that was something that was very spiritual. It wasn't planned that way, but that's, that's the way it happened. And that's the story of, of Uhuru Africa. So now, that's 1960. And you've talked about the fact how you had this deep indoctrination from your father and from influences in your neighborhood as far as uh, the pride of being an African born in America. But you still hadn't made it to the continent yet. What was the circumstance behind your first journey to, to Africa? There was an organization called the American Society of African Culture. And they were established in Manhattan, and they already had made contact with Africa. Uh, they would print exhibitions of Ethiopian painters or, or sculptors from Nigeria, from Ghana. So they already had an exchange program going on because it was vital, it's so vital that the, that the African influence is so strong. It's so strong in the Western Hemisphere, you know. And it had to be a recognition of the source of the spiritual strength they come out in, in this particular music, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. So you went to Nigeria. And what happened, they choose 29 artists to go to Nigeria, 1961, one year after we did Uhuru Africa. And the lineup was Lionel Hampton, had eight members of his band, Nina Simone, had Amal Abdul Malik on bass with her, Natalie Hindar Hindaris, she played classical piano, Martha Flowers, the great soprano singers, Hale Woodruff was there, Langston Hughes was there, Jeffrey Holden was there, and Brock Peters was there. And two dancers from the Savoy Ballroom, Al Mims and Leon James. And I joined them with Booker Irvin, the great tenor saxophonist, and Scobie Stroman, a drummer from New York. We went to Nigeria. We spent 10 days to see what was the relationship culturally, spiritually, in every way between Nigeria and African Americans in America. It was the very first summit. And it was fascinating. And what blew my mind, too, how much they loved Langston Hughes. When we arrived, they knew Langston right away treated him with great honors, and they would have discussions during the day and concerts at night. So, for example, they would have some traditional African dances on this side of the stage at a concert. They'd have uh, two Savoy Ballroom dances on this side of the stage. So Savoy Ballroom dances, they would dance, you know, their thing, and the traditional music would do their thing to show the relationship. So in every way, poetry, painting, sculpture, music, I played with Lyle Hampton's band, and we had an incredible time. But what happened for me, we arrived about 11 o'clock at night. The Nigerians had about 50 drummers at the airport. And when the door of the plane opened up, you could smell the air of West Africa. And for me, it was like, I'm back home. I'm back home with my ancestors. I'm back with my great grandfather and thousands of years of civilization. And I came with Brock Peters and Jeffrey, because we're all very tall. And we came out to play together. And some of us kissed the earth. And one guy ran up to me. He said, Well, 
He said, you finally decided to come back home. He said, you've been gone for all the years. What took you so long? <laughs> but the way he said it, it brought tears to my eyes. Because we forget we have an ancestral home. The greatest continent on the planet Earth is Africa. Civilization, unbelievable. Music, unbelievable, you know. So <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning. And at night, I would hang out in the clubs. And the West African mus musicians owned their own clubs. There was a wonderful <coughs> West African named Bobby Benson. He played the most incredible West African guitar. He played some other stuff, you know. And he owned this club, and the club was called the Cabin Bamboo. And the people were dancing in this club. The West African clubs have a big round circle like this. And the tables are all around the circle. So people, they come and dance. And they dance a style of music they call the high life. But when I heard this music, it was like hearing Calypso coming back to West Africa. And everybody was dancing, you know. But on weekends, they would bring the traditional music from the country. And at night, they would bring the young West African jazz musicians. And that's where I met Fela. I met Fela in 1963. I met him when I went back to Nigeria. He was playing trumpet. And we played together. So the young West African musicians have been listening to our music here. Listen to our struggle here, because the African-American people remember, because of the struggle of civil rights, we inspired the African people all over the planet. Our struggle, whether it was Malcolm or Martin Luther King or all our giants, Ellington, whatever, they gave us inspiration, you see. So I had this wonderful, wonderful coordination. But I have to point out something. I had never heard traditional African music live I've heard on recordings, you know. So on weekends, he would bring groups from the country. So this particular night I was there, and Bobby was very nice, always had a table. he take good care of us, you know. This particular night, they brought some people from the country, and they had this huge bellophone. And like the whole family played this instrument. Like the grandfather, the grandmother, the child, they're all playing this instrument, and they had these women and these women had bolts of cloth, just like cloth that you, you know, have for your clothes, like bolts of cloth. And they were playing a certain rhythm on these bolts of cloth, you know. So now I'm watching this, you know, and this balafone, and I'm listening to this music, because the music of Africa, they have the magic of taking the rhythms and the rhythms like this. They, they, they like Mother Africa itself, there's a magic. There's a mystery to the continent, and it comes out in the music, because the music describes the continent itself. If you go to Sahara, you're going to hear the Sahara music. You will hear the Sahara in the music. If you're up in the mountains, you're going to hear the mountains in the music. And it has this incredible power of, of, of music, mm -hmm. you know. So now, now, uh you got to tell, you, you mentioned Langston Hughes, and you mentioned that Langston worked with you on the Uhuru Africa, and that uh, uh, Langston was on this journey to Nigeria. Uh, you got to tell the Langston Hughes funeral story. What about Langston? The Langston Hughes funeral. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> My wife was here from Senegal. Now, she's going to tell me later on that I made a mistake. I said something I shouldn't have said, or I forgot something. <laughs> she's usually right. <laughs> well, Langston and I became very close. And Langston, when he died, he left a will. And in the will, that I should play his funeral with a trio. So his secretary called me on the phone. He said, Randy Wesson, he said, Langston got it in his will. He wants you to play his funeral. I said, what? He said, yeah. So I got Ed Blackwell from New Orleans, great, great New Orleans drummer, and Bill Wood, the bassist. So we arrived at the funeral home at the set time. And 
Langston was laying in, in the coffin. Well, he was laying in the coffin, like most people lay in the coffin. <laughs> but I didn't realize he was putting us all on, right? So in the other room, there's about 200 people there, including Dr. Ralph Bunch of the United Nations, including Nina Horn, including the Honor Bon Tomps, all the heavyweights came, you know. So they had the reefs in the other room, these big reefs, you know. So we walked in, so Ed Blackwell has got his drums, you know. He said, oh, man, he said, where do I set up my drums, you know? I said, just move the recent sites. I'm not touching those reefs. <laughs> that New Orleans thing, right? So I'm not touching those reefs, man, you know. But anyhow, they moved the recent side, and I knew Langston loved the blues. He loved the blues with a passion. Langston loved the blues, you know. And I stayed up all night, and I wrote a blues for Langston, right? I was going to play. So finally, it came time for the ceremony. Everybody would walk by and look at Langston walk by and go sit in the other room. And so I'm outside getting a breath of air. So his secretary says, Randy Wesson, it's time to start the service. I said, OK. I said, where's the minister? He said, no. He said, you're going to start it. I said, me? He said, yeah. I said, what do I do? He said, you tell the story about the blues. Make a long story short. On the Bon Tons, Red Langston's poetry. I played one hour of blues. I didn't know what else to do. And it was really incredible. So at the end, Lena on, she said she didn't know whether they clap her hands or they stomp her feet, but Langston put us all on. Two weeks later, the secretary called me on the phone and said, Langston said, Randy, be sure to pay the trio union scale. <laughs> 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 and that was, that's Langston Hughes, you know what I mean? He went out putting us all on, you know. But what a great, great, great man. Wow, wow. Now, before, we, before we, 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 we open the floor for any questions any of these folks might have, you got to tell us, uh, if, if, if you know Randy Weston and Randy Weston's music, you know that Randy Weston's piano playing was indelibly touched by the influence of Thelonious Monk. So how did you first encounter Thelonious Monk, and what kind of relationship did you and Monk develop? Well, you know, we grew up with, with sound. Uh, it wasn't how many notes you played, but all, all the giants had their own sound. You could tell Sonny Rollins by his sound. You tell Coleman Hawkins by his sound. You could, tell, you could tell Louis Armstrong by his sound. So because in the music, our geniuses, our royalty, they were able to capture their spirit and put their spirit into the instrument, which means their voice. So that means when Louis played his trumpet, the spirit of his, of his inner spiritual self goes in that trumpet and out comes the sound. So when you hear Louis Armstrong, you don't have to see him, you hear his sound. The same thing was true of Duke Ellington. When you hear Duke Ellington play the piano, it's his sound that scares you. Because a lot of people play the piano, but how do you get your own sound? Because you don't blow into it like a saxophone or a trumpet, but they did that. So what happened, it goes before Monk, actually. Uh, although I have to point out, Coleman Hawkins was my idol. Because of Coleman Hawkins, I discovered everybody for me in our music. But going back before that, Ahmed Abdul Malik, he was a great bass player. He also played the oud. His father was from the Sudan. And downtown Brooklyn, on Atlantic Avenue, we have the, the North African Ra Arab section of Brooklyn restaurants, uh, stores, et cetera, et cetera, and music. So Malik would take me down there, and we would listen to the oud and the kanun. That means that they could play notes in between the notes. On the piano, you can't play in between the notes. You only play what's there, but they play notes in between the notes, you know? So Malik could do that on the bass, and I was always fascinated with sound, because I love sound. I love uh, Leslie Young because of his sound. You tell me it's his voice, you know the difference. So anyhow, I tried to do that, and we were playing local bands, and we could put out the bands, because we were playing some of that weird stuff, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, I followed Coleman Hawkins from Fletcher Henderson up until he died. 
Because of Coleman Hawkins, I discovered Hank Jones. Because of Coleman Hawkins, I discovered Sir Charles Thompson. Coleman Hawkins was the first one to record Dizzy Gillespie, the first one to record Monk, the first one to record Miles Davis was Coleman Hawkins. A lot of people don't know this. And he was the true, not only the father of the tenor saxophone, but he set a foundation for all saxophone players after that. Number one, that nobody had the sound of Coleman Hawkins. He had a sound that was incredible. And I fell in love with the sound and it happened because of Body and Soul, which was a big hit, 1939. Even the Housewives uh, bought Body and Soul, which is on the 78 disc. And the genius of Body and Soul is not only because of the sound of Coleman Hawkins, but he was always improvising. And he was such a genius that Coleman Hawkins is not playing the melody in Body and Soul, but you can hear the melody. And that's true genius for improvisation, because the masses could do that. They could play around the melody when they improvise, but you hear the melody, but they're doing something else. But Coleman Hawkins set the standard for that, and he was always running chain, always running. So I went to 52nd Street one night, and Coleman had the, the quartet, and had this guy on the piano, and he's only hitting a couple of notes, you know, a couple of notes. You know. Then he would stop, you know. So I said, well, I said, what, what's Cole Hawkins doing with this guy? You know, I can play more piano than this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't dig it. Well, someone told me to go back. I went back, and the first time I heard Ruby, my dear, which is one of Thelonious Monk's master, master compositions, was him and Cole Hawkins. And when I heard him play, I heard that magic I was looking for. And when I say magic, all the masses, all, all of those people who take the instruments and do something different with it, you know, for me, they bring the magic of Mother Nature into the music. And Mother Nature is still the master artist. She is. She provides every day. It's cold. It rains. It snows. And our music is, is to be close to, to nature. Because Mother Nature is the true orchestra. We learn from Mother Nature. The sound of the birds, the sound of the thunder, the sound of the wind, the sound of the insects. That's how man created music, you see. So when I heard Monk play, I heard and felt what music must have been like in, during the African empires. I heard and felt spiritually of sound and music that took me back to the ancient influence. And I can't explain why. Mm -hmm. This is what I heard. I said, wow, I want to meet this guy. I'll find out how he get that sound on the piano. Mm -hmm. So I went up to him, and I was always love to meet the musicians and uh, just say hello. I said, Mr. Moore, can I, can I come by and visit you? He said, yeah, you come by my house. Yes, OK. So I went to his house, and uh, Nellie, who was wife after, she let me in. And Monk was sitting in the room. He was sitting in a chair there. And I walked in. He told me to sit down. The piano was there. And it was a picture of Billie Holiday in the middle of the ceiling. <laughs> and it was a red light in the room. So I sat down. Finally, I got the energy to start asking some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Monk, how, how you do this? Mr. Monk, this, Mr. Monk, grandma. No response. <laughs> <laughs> About one hour, I'm asking this guy questions. He said nothing. And he had the radio playing very softly, you know. So after a while, I, I, I was embarrassed. But at the same time, I could not leave that room. The power in that room, if a Billy Holiday in the middle of the ceiling in a red light <laughs> and a Thelonious Monk sitting here playing the radio, I couldn't leave. <laughs> I stayed in that room for hours. I forgot how long. Somehow, I got the energy. So, Mr. Mulker, 
I thank you very much, sir, you know, for inviting me to your home, you know. He said, he said, yeah. He said, uh, listen to all kinds of music. He said, and come see me again. <laughs> <laughs> You understand my situation? <laughs> <laughs> so I came out of his house. The term they use is perplexed, <laughs> confused, embarrassed. But I went back one month later. Monk played the piano two or three hours for me. So then I found out later, which is what they call Sufism, which is very ancient, ancient. That communication can be without the spoken word. You can communicate without using the spoken word. You can communicate through vibrations. And I feel like he was checking me out. And from that point on, somehow, Monk took me back to Africa in his sound and his music, and somehow my connection with Africa and Monk, and then I discovered Duke Ellington. Because Duke had that sound, and Monk came out of it. Because there was James P. Johnson, then there was Duke. And it's that kind of sound for me, Africa in the piano, pure Africa in the piano, African spirituality into the piano, African rhythms into the piano. So no matter what the instrument is, whether it's a table or a Coca-Cola bottle, the spirit of Africa goes into that instrument. So somehow having this kind of love listening, spending time with traditional people, spending time with Monk, watching Dizzy, all of a sudden, what came out of me start to happen. But for me, it's like recognition of your ancestors. Because your ancestors had the pure sound of Africa. They spoke like African people because they are African people. They do things in a polyrhythmic way because African people are polyrhythmic. And the reason for that is because the continent of Africa is polyrhythmic. Before a man ever arrived, this continent was swinging. <laughs> yeah, watch the lions and the tigers and the birds. Everybody's into rhythm. And the mother of Africa, she goes like this. Her music is like this because the music only describes the continent itself. So that meant that na Mother Nature, Mother Nature, insects and birds, the, the, the thunder, the, the sound of the dog crowding a baby cry, all of this is the foundation of our music. And that's why this music is eternal. And that's why if Louis Armstrong was alive today, he would be a superstar. Why? Because those early people they were masters of the blues. And when you are masters of the blues, you can give a message with just a few words. Today in modern society, we blah, blah, blah a lot. We talk a lot today. Blah, 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 blah. Everything is fast tempo. Blah, 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 blah. Everywhere you hear that, because that's the rhythm now with the machines and the computers. And the tempo is fast. You don't find that, that slow tempo. But those people in the early part of the 20th century, 19th century, they were closer to Africa. And that's why they were such a creative period, because they took what happened from their grandmother, their great-grandmother, going back 10,000 years of history in Africa. The ancient Egyptians were, were masters. They created instruments. They made harps seven foot tall. Incredible instruments. They made drums, string instruments. You see the, the, the ancient monuments in Egypt. You see all the instruments. Thousand years history of music. But this music had to capture the spirit of the continent. And the continent is magic, you see. So because of Mr. Monk, Mr. Ellington, somehow Randy Weston arrived. But it's something that you can't, it's something that I think happens naturally. Sound. It's what comes out of you. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Like Why you talk so much, Fuck Elaborate you. on his Moroccan experience. He wants you to, he want, and the gentleman would like you to elaborate on your experience in Morocco. Well, I, I did a State Department tour in 1967, and the last country was Morocco. 
And when you do those tours, you have to make a report what you liked about the tour, what you didn't like about the tour. I stayed there about uh, one week working on the, the tour to turn over to the State Department because the way it works, you get half the money before the tour and you get the other half once you make the report. So while I was there, I was, well, before that, when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan's show and I saw the decline of African-American music or recognized as such, when I saw that happen, I said, I want to get to Africa. I want to get to Africa. I want to be around the traditional people. I want to learn why I do what I do because what I have come from thousands of years of civilization. Our music didn't start in New Orleans. No, it's, our music goes back thousand, thousand years. That whole concept of music, the whole time, spontaneous creativity, polyrhythms, humor, you know, spirituality, that's all Mother Africa. And we come out of that, we're just branches. Because you know, to have a strong tree, you gotta have a root. And the root is that continent. And it's, it's something that um, I could talk forever about the music. But the question was about The Morocco. question was how you wound up in Morocco. Went yeah. back to New York. Mm -hmm. And I got letters from Morocco saying the Moroccan people love your music. They want you to come back. I went back to Morocco with the trio and I stayed between six and seven years. While I was there, I was wondering why the creator sent me to Morocco. I had already been to Nigeria. I wanted to go back to Nigeria, but I was during the time of the Biafra War. Uh, and in Morocco was a country where the languages are Arabic, the Berber languages, French, Spanish, and very little English. So I wanted to figure why Morocco. Then I found out why. I discovered the African people who were taken in slavery and had to walk the Sahara Desert. You see, our ancestors were taken across the Atlantic Ocean on those tired boats, they had to suffer that humiliation. But these brothers and sisters, they had to walk the Sahara Desert. So from the West African empires, like Mali, Songhe, Ghana, the ancient empire, they were taken as soldiers up to Morocco. Now, these people in North Africa, most of them are in the southern part of <coughs> North Africa, and they produce an incredible music. I discovered the people called the Ganawa people, and they are just like us. We made the Atlantic, they had to make Sahara, but we're the same people. And when I heard their music in Morocco, it was like hearing the black church, blues, and jazz all at the same time. Then it made me realize we're just leaves. We're just little leaves of the tree of Mother Africa. So what we think is new, just a combination of different parts of Africa coming together, coming in contact with other cultures. But the root is always the same, you see. So with Ganawa people, they taught me to be a master musician, not like in the West. In the West, to be a master musician, all you have to do is be able to play well, and that's it. Not in these traditional societies, no. To be a master musician, you have to be, first of all, respected by the community. That means no matter where you go in the world, you have to support your community. And that's what happened with the older musicians. That's why people like Louis and Duke Count Basie, that's why they reach a level we could never reach. Not only were they musically advanced, but they also served the black community. So that meant if it was a problem with orphan children or handicapped children and whatnot, there would be benefits. People don't realize that. And traditional people told me this, for your talent, no matter where you go, you're supposed to serve your community. That's number one, they have to be respected. Two, they have to be historians. I've heard African musicians sit down and play and give 1,000 years of the history of their people through song and music. Can we do that with our music? Can we give a history of our music like that? That's what they have to do. They have to be able to be healers. 
they have to be able to, they know that, uh, that the human body, we're all walking music, all of us. Your heart is your drum, your voice is your sound. And they say when you become ill, that means you're out of tune with Mother Nature. Because we're still nature, Mother Nature's creatures. We try to be beyond that. But we still form part of Mother Nature. So they say when you become ill, they play certain music to bring you back. Okay? And each of us have a color in their community. So it may be the color red, the color blue, the color white, the color yellow, the color black. There's a certain music for each color. Now, when the people have their special ceremonies, around three days before Ramadan in Morocco, people who have big homes, they have to give their homes to these people for three days. They have to donate their home. That's, that's the way it works. And what they do for the first two days, they play music in the streets, they do acrobats with music, they eat fire with music, they play games with music, they can be in this room with just this instrument they call the hajuj, which is the mother of what we call the banjo and guitar, which goes back to ancient Egypt. They play this instrument, and they say this instrument they in touch with God. They can be in the next room with a dancer, and I can be sitting here like this with bullet, and I can take this bottle of water and give it to my wife and told her put it behind her back. You know, they'll come into the room with certain music and go right to where the water is. They play games with music, you see. But when they come to the serious stuff, I had been with them for two years. I had never attended a serious ceremony. And I went to the chief, and I said to the chief, I'll never forget his name was Fata. I said, I would like to experience the real ceremony of your people. He said, no, I don't think you should go. Because when people go in trance with this music, sometimes if they feel something that's not right, something can happen to that person. OK, so he didn't want me to go. Well, I've been with him for two years. I said, man, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, I'm all right. <laughs> so finally he said, OK. But he, that, he, I had a partner. I had a club by this time I'll talk about it after. But anyhow, my partner, he, he went with me because he could speak Arabic and whatnot. So I had on my jalaba, and I sat in the corner, and they were in a room with about 200 people. And they had this instrument, and they what they called the, the kakaba, the kakrab, they called it. It goes back to the clappers going back to the Egyptian empire, you know, and you hear these rhythms like this. And then the string instrument, and this thing is going on, I'm sitting in the corner, and then they start to play the color red. The people come out and they dress in the color red, then they start to play their color. And these people start to dance, and they dance in a strange way, because it's like we can usually tell each other by the way we move. If you know somebody, you can see them a half a block away. And you can tell by the way, yeah, that's so-and-so. Not only by the face, but we all have certain rhythms that we use with our body that we can be recognized. Oh, that's so-and-so over there, by the way they walk. We walk you know. But what happened, when they go into this ceremony, their rhythms change. They, they, they go into something I can't explain. And I sat there, and the music, the incense, the rhythm was so powerful. I felt myself getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I said, man, I'm into some heavy stuff here. <laughs> you know, and the chief told me, don't go, right? <laughs> but to make a law, and it's all spiritual. I have to, it's all spiritual music. It's a healing process. Well, they did the color blue. When I heard the color blue, I knew it was my color. I just knew it. I felt it. And I thought about the blues. And I thought about Duke. Remember Duke's piano at home? was, it was blue. I remember Monk. We used to hang out with Monk. He always wear blue all the time. And I thought about that color. But I sat there and I heard this music. Now, they start like four in the afternoon till about six o'clock the next morning. This music, continuously. At one point, 
the guy playing this instrument, it was so powerful, he, he collapsed. Another guy went and grabbed the instrument and kept it going. Because when the people are in trance, you can't break the rhythm. This is a spiritual movement because the whole body is vibrations. And this music reaches your soul. It's, it's serious stuff, really. And so they kept playing. And anyhow, 6 o'clock in the morning, the ceremony was over. And I came out, and the sun was bright, you know. And I was in a trance for about two weeks. And what I mean by trance, I functioned. But this music took me on, on another level. It took me on a spiritual high that I had never experienced before. But it made me better understand the black church. It made me better understand Duke Ellis. It made me better understand Billy Alton. It made me understand John Lee Hooker. It made me understand that our music is just a continuation for me of, of African civilization. So I took a long time to answer your question. <laughs> But that's the soul about the Ganawa people in Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time. This is, this is a wonderful night. Uh, I want to know how people who were not musicians affected you, like Sheikh Montadio and uh, Wayne Chandler and Ancient Futures. Of course. I mean, how did they? How, I mean, was it just meeting them? It was in, what, what was it? The, the book itself or Wayne? I don't know. Well, I know that you named, uh, you, you, you were commissioned to write uh, Ancient Futures, well, you were commissioned to write music for Lincoln Center, and you called it Ancient Futures because of reading Wayne Chandler's book, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know a little bit about that. Yeah, about the book? Uh, oh, how, they, how, how, how Wayne, how people like, how non-musicians. People like Wayne Chandler and Sheikh Anta Diop and others influenced you. They they took us back uh, to the beginning of civilization. <coughs> they they taught me through their writings and their works of the complexities of the Egyptian mystery system, which is before religion as, as we know it. They connected me with the Chinese empire. Uh, for example, the Shang dynasty, which is one of the oldest Chinese civilizations, was a black civilization. A lot of people don't know that, you see. So they took me back to say, to know yourself, you're standing on the shoulders of your ancestors. You're not complete until you can go back to African civilization because it's, all, it's the oldest civilization and all civilizations come out of Africa. Africa had the first universities. It's Timbuktu, Fez, Sankora, Europe, Greece, they all went to study in Egypt. Greek civilization comes from Egypt. All the Greek philosophers had to go to Egypt and study. Alexandria, Alexander the Great establishes his library in Egypt because that's where he discovered the sacred books. The sacred books we have in Timbuktu, you know, texts of, of our history. It's vital because when you know you come from greatness, from me, it inspires you to be great. If you think you have nothing, which is what we were taught, you see, you, you lose your inspiration. And I think that's what's happening today. A lot of our young people and old people, sometimes we lose hope because we are taught that we began in slavery. We were taught that we began when we were civilized with people from the north. When we civilized the people from the north, just the reverse. And you see it itself, you look at the Western Hemisphere. And wherever you find African people, whether it's in San Salvador and Brazil, whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's in Jamaica, where you find African people, you find a very powerful spiritual music. And I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about spirituality, which is much older than religion. 
And you find that there's that recognition, there's a higher spiritual force. And Wayne Chandler and I was, I met Sheikh Anthony Deal in Dakar in 19... 1985, I met him, and I was performing with a great Senegalese drummer named Dudu Nairos, a master drummer from Senegal. This guy played five drums. He conducts an orchestra of 100 drums through dance. Most of the drummers are women in Africa. I've seen this, you know. So with the up, I had already had his books, but I had never met him. He had just come from Atlanta, Georgia, because Atlanta is the only city in the world that truly recognized Sheikh Anthony Diop. He was a, a great Egyptologist, anthropologist, linguist. He wrote the history of African unity, and he studied German so he could go to Germany and study the mummies to learn about the fact that the mummies were black that the Egyptian civilization was a black civilization. And he was a scientist. It wasn't emotion. So I went to his laboratory, and I sat in front of him like this, you know, and he only spoke French. And I didn't understand much of what he was saying. But I looked at his face, I looked at him. I was looking at a pharaoh that had come back to lead our people, to understand why, why we have what we have. Where did that come from, you know? So, and Wayne Chandler, he's a master because Wayne, in his book, Ancient Future, he describes the very beginning. He describes, he talks about Isis, Osiris. He speaks about when music was brought to the earth. He speaks about the, the ancient laws of, of, of ancient Egypt. We set the foundation of spirituality and how we've gotten away from those ancient laws. <coughs> so you, those, that's why those two people made a major impact on my life because it made me understand Duke Ellington better. Why would he write black and tan fantasy? Why would he write uh, music about black people? And Duke had a tremendous collection of African music. Paul Robeson had a tremendous collection of African music. Yeah, because that's the foundation of all music. It's the oldest music in the world. And this music was created. It's like uh, I had one incredible experience. A, a friend of mine from Mali, he showed me a video. He said, watch this video. And in this video, you see a blue house like this. And in this house, there are three locks. One, two, three. He said, watch this, you know. I'm watching. All of a sudden, I see some people come to the house. And they open the three locks. They open the door. Out comes a bellophone, and the bellophone is in white cloth. They bring the bellophone out. They sit the bellophone on the ground. The oldest member of the society, he gets on the bellophone, he starts to play. Then all the young people come and join him. They play all night long. The next day, when they stop playing, they take that instrument, put it back in the white cloth, put it back in the blue house, put the three locks, that doesn't happen again until another 20 years. Every 20 years they do that. The societies in Africa, you cannot die. If there's a funeral, you cannot die unless certain songs are sung. If you don't sing those songs, you cannot officially die. There's societies in Africa, if you're five years old, you cannot become six until you learn the songs of a six-year-old. You can be on the planet 90 years. If you don't learn those songs, you'll be five years old. <laughs> See? So when you see the, 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 the incredible complexities of African traditional music, you understand that we come from that, you see. And it's so powerful that no matter where we take it, we take that same uh, Egyptian call that Turath, which means ancestral memory. That means I can sit here and I can go back 10,000 years and sit right here and take myself 10 miles back, you know. Uh, the book. The book is called African Rhythms, and uh, I see that our time has eclipsed, and we do have some copies of the book for sale out in the lobby, and you can speak with Randy at that, at that time, and I'll be happy to sign the book. And 
Thank you for living such a rich life.